Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. Got a crazy story out of Canada. Uh, Bill and Barry both sent me this from Newsweek. Workers allegedly threatened with jail if they don't work overtime. Again, it's happening in Canada, but Shira Libartov wrote the story. Scaffolders, scaffolders at a Canadian oil mine could allegedly be jailed for refusing to work overtime, according to a company memo which has been circulating online. A lot of stuff to unpack there, including scaffolders. I assume that's someone who does scaffolding for a living. And a Canadian oil mine. But the letter from the company, which is a scaffolding rental service in Alberta, informed workers of a court order to cease and desist coordinated overtime refusals. An image of the document was shared on Reddit on Sunday by an anonymous user who said their father was a scaffolder for the company. Forced overtime or jail threat, said the title of the post. Scaffolding, of course, is a dangerous job that leads to accidents every year, some of them fatal. In the U.S., scaffold-related incidents result in about 60 deaths and 4,500 injuries annually, according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. That's the U.S., though, not Canada. The most common injuries are serious, including traumatic brain injuries, spinal cord injuries, amputations, broken bones, and lacerations. The Redditor said their dad allegedly worked uh, at a plant, which is a large oil mine in Alberta. Due to difficulty attracting labor, the company allegedly offered an extra $150 per day to its workers, but the scaffolders were excluded from the incentive. So it's been 90 degrees every day for the past couple of weeks, and these guys are out there working hard with everyone else and not getting the same bonus, the user said. So they started only working the hours required under the contract, which is 40 hours a week. That didn't go over well with the management as the viral memo revealed. And here's the issue. They keep referring to the memo, but they also say that there's a court order. So I'm sure you understand that if someone sends you a memo and says, hey, there's a court order, you respond by saying, I'd rather see the court order than the memo. Because the court order might be something you've got to follow. A memo doesn't have the force of a court order. So the letter was dated August 25th, said, for the last three days, scaffolders have refused to work overtime beyond their 10-hour shifts at the plant site and have refused to accept overtime shifts for the weekend, which is Friday through Sunday on both day and night shifts. These guys are working 10-hour shifts, not 8-hour shifts, 10-hour shifts. The company and union reps appeared in front of the Alberta Labor Relations Board that day, said the memo. The board ruled that the scaffolders' coordinated refusal to work voluntary overtime constituted an unlawful strike violating the Labor Relations Code. So what they're getting at is they're saying, look, if one person decided not to do it or a couple of people decided not to do it, that's fine. But if everyone gets together and says, hey, let's all do this, it's coordinated. Now, whether that should be wrong or not, I'm not going to say because, number one, this is a Canadian law. And number two, that's just a philosophical issue. We've all heard of situations, in America even, where a group of people get together and go, we don't like the way we're being treated. Let's all call in sick on Thursday. And they call that a sick out. Or there's a bunch of different nicknames for it. But the point is that if everyone calls in sick on the same day, it causes all kinds of problems. Do the workers have the right to call in sick? Yes. But when they all call in sick on the same day, are they all really sick? And do they actually have to be sick to call in sick? And then you get back to, okay, that's a coordinated effort. Is that legal? So apparently the Alberta Labor Relations Board came to the conclusion that all of these people refusing to do overtime was a coordinated effort of some sort. A copy of the finding and directives posted online confirmed that the board ordered workers to cease and desist, noting that its directive would be enforceable as an order of the court. So apparently that is an order of the court. And you have to understand a lot of court orders can be very convoluted, and courts speak through their orders. That's something you learn in law school, that phrase, courts speak through their orders. So if you hear that something happened in court yesterday involving you, okay, something happened in court yesterday, you could go get a transcript of the entire proceeding and read it. 
But that actually won't help you much. Because what you need to see is a court order, if any, signed by the judge and entered by the court. So if a court order gets signed and entered, you read the court order because that's what you follow, not the discussion that happened in court back and forth. I've seen judges saying all kinds of stuff, and it gets reduced to one sentence or two sentences. That's a court order. So you want to see the court order, but occasionally you'll see a thing that says, you know, court order and judgment or, you know, court order instructing this, and it'll have a longer title. But here we have finding and directives, and they say that it's treated as an order of the court. So there you have to read the finding and the directives. And the finding, by the way, won't be something you've got to follow. It's just there to help explain the directives. So it probably says something like, hearings were held, both sides are represented, this panel heard testimony from the following people, and after due deliberation and considering everything we were told and that we heard, we have reached the following conclusions. And then they'd say that their conclusions are blah, 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 blah. Therefore, we direct the following, and they have their directives. And then they say it's order of the court. If that's true, then their directives become things that you must follow. The company's memo starkly detailed the potential consequences of defying this order. Scaffolders who continued to refuse overtime work could face termination, a hiring ban, legal action seeking damages, and contempt of court proceedings resulting in the possibility of fines and even potentially jail. Whether you'd actually get thrown in jail for refusing overtime in response to this, it's hard to say. Seems extreme. Uh, we also expect that the owners will be very upset with striking employees out of the memo. It is possible the owner would consider a site ban for those involved. The audience on Reddit was stunned by the ruling, flooding the post with outraged comments. The thing that gets me is the refusal to work voluntary overtime, and they put the word voluntary in quotes. So how is not accepting voluntary overtime considered a strike? Doesn't seem very voluntary to me. Refusing overtime is an illegal strike? What in the hell kind of labor board we got anyway? <laughs> That's absolutely ridiculous. I'm shocked at another user. This forum on Reddit is home to a steady stream of disgruntled workers who anonymously circulate messages from their bosses for the Internet's review. Uh, so uh, Newsweek reached out to the person who posted this as well as the company that issued the memo and apparently did not get a response back in time for press time on the story. So this is an unusual situation. Uh, it's not as crazy as you might guess, because I've heard of situations similar to this. Obviously, people in my audience will be reminded of the workers at the hospital who were all at will, meaning that they could quit anytime they wanted to, and they could be fired anytime the hospital wanted to fire them. And another hospital made it clear that these people would all be treated better and paid more if they went over to this hospital over here. And so a whole bunch of them did. They said, yep, we're all going over there. And just coincidentally, they all left right around the same time because apparently word got around that, hey, we can get better treatment over there and better money. And when the hospital that had these people leaving heard about this, they ran to court and got an injunction, temporary restraining order, and a court ordered these people not to leave and stay where they were, despite the fact they were at will. And at the time I did the first video, it was a Thursday or Friday, I said, I'm willing to bet you that by Monday or Tuesday, whenever they have the next hearing on this matter, the judge is going to dissolve the TRO and let these people leave. He's just doing this to buy some time for the parties to see if perhaps they can work something out. And that's what happened. The judge dissolved the order and those people all left. Uh, but a lot of people got upset that the judge even issued the injunction for the short period of time in which he did. And I understand the point. I do get the point. But you have to look at it from a court's perspective. And, and the judge is in court. And these people come in on probably Thursday. And they say, we have an emergency situation. We got half our staff leaving in this one department. It's going to cripple the hospital. And they're all leaving at the same time. And uh, we, we, we've heard all kinds of crazy stories out there. And so we want an injunction to keep these people leaving, at least for a period of time till we can resolve what's going on. So that's going to be a temporary restraining order. And so the court, when they're asked to issue a TRO in an emergency, 
they have to look at it and go, well, what are all the different things that we balance here? And one of them simply is how much harm will come to all the parties if it's granted versus how much harm will come to all the parties if it's not granted. And I'm pretty certain that the judge said, okay, it's Friday. I can have a hearing with everyone here on Monday. And maybe the parties can work this out over the weekend. Now, I know a lot of people say, Steve, hospitals are open on the weekend. So some of these people would have been forced to go to work at the place they just quit, which they thought they had the right to leave because it's an at-will state. And, and you're saying that's, that that's right? Well, I'm just saying that's the kind of thing that happens in court. And so the two days on principle may have been a gigantic deal, but the very next court hearing, the judge dissolved the TRO and let them all leave. And so when someone comes into a courtroom or a hearing board or whatever and claims there's some emergency situation, the court's got to do what they can to preserve things and, and keep things moving forward. Now, the weird part about this is it's people building scaffolds at an oil mine. And there's no indication here that there's anything of an emergency nature to this. It's just that apparently you got to, you know, drill your oil while the sun shines. Or I guess mine your oil. Because I'm assuming that in the summertime it's easier to mine the oil than it is in the wintertime. And I understand that in Canada they can occasionally get snow in the wintertime. Crazy thing. So it might be that they got good hot weather up there right now. And as far as management goes, we need to be running full steam ahead, around the clock, boom, 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 boom. And if these people won't do the overtime, then we can't go full speed ahead. So, you know, I don't know what's going on here, but it seems crazy to me. And hopefully the people who are working have representatives who can either appeal this or go back in and ask for reconsideration. Because it sounds to me like people who are working 10-hour shifts doing heavy manual labor in 90-degree temperatures. Um, I can see at the end of a 10-hour shift going, you know something, I think I'm done for the day. That, that seems reasonable to me. Now, I, call me crazy, but that seems reasonable. So that's the story from Newsweek. Workers allegedly threatened with jail if they don't work overtime. Shirley Bartov wrote that Bill and Barry both sent it. And I don't always explain the shirts I'm wearing. But I'm going to stand up in a second and let you see the shirt. But I got it in the mail yesterday from a gentleman who sent a letter. <laughs> says, Steve, I've been watching your channel for several years. find it very informative. Thanks. When I initially started watching you, you did a segment which you displayed a photo you had taken of an iguana. You alluded to the iguana as being a noble animal. <laughs> that inspired me. I did a screen capture and a little photoshopping. I came up with a design. After several years of procrastination, I finally finished the idea. I hope you enjoy it, Don. And he put it on his shirt. And this is, in fact, a photograph of an iguana that I took years ago on vacation. And um, I'll stand up so you can see it a little better. But the iguana was up in a tree. And he was about yay big. I mean, big iguana. And I took the photograph with a lens about this big. I mean, it was from far away with a big lens. But I got a great picture of this iguana just sitting up in a tree surveying his kingdom. And I just thought to myself, you know, that, that iguana certainly looks like he's comfortable up there. Like, like he's, he's happy. And, and he seems rather noble. Just kind of looking around. Just, you know, there you go. So Don did the Photoshop and then made me a shirt. <laughs> so there you go. Questions or comments, put them below. Let's talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Lato's Law. I'm writing a book. Yes, I've got the page numbers done.